visiting with David Cutcliffe in the SEC office. Uh, David, uh, the SEC lost an interesting fellow in Mike Leach, passed away. Uh, Mississippi State's coach passed away in December. You uh, had a relationship with Mike, didn't you? Yeah, we coached a against each other. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, he, um, he, he left Oklahoma about the time as the offensive coordinator when we played Oklahoma in the bowl game. It worked mm -hmm. with Bob Stoops, and uh, so we developed a friendship then, and we coached against each other as head coaches, but that had nothing to do with the relationship. You had to sit mm -hmm. down and talk to Mike Leach to really understand the man. And maybe you walked away from there understanding less than you thought you did. <laughs> but a delightful individual, I'll never forget, I got a call from him at the beginning of the um, pandemic. And uh, we had been sent away at, at Duke in March and similar timing at Mississippi State. He calls me from Key West where he has a place. He said, Cut, come on down. I got it figured out. He said, Sun, salt water, and alcohol kill anything. <laughs> we'll be safe down here. I said, Mike, I'll have to pass on that one. But uh, good, good man, uh, cared about young people, uh, coached the right way. You know, a lot of that got lost mm -hmm. in his quirkiness. Heck of a football coach first. Mm -hmm. uh, but really did care about his people, his staff, uh, that was the part that saddened me. I'd gotten to know a lot of his staff, and that, that, that suddenness of losing mm -hmm. someone so special so quickly, whew, devastating. You had a chance to visit uh, 16 oh. schools in the spring, and I say 16 because Texas and Oklahoma were part of that. Why visit those two? Well, I mean, the, the inevitable is January of 2024, their focus, mm -hmm. I don't care when the date is, your focus is on your next schedule. College football is run. As soon as you finish your bowl game, as soon as you're back in January, you're starting a new season. Mm -hmm. And I don't just see the coaches. I didn't go to see just Coach Venables or Coach Sarkeesian. I went in the building to build a relationship with everybody in there. Mm -hmm. you know, their ops people, their equipment people, their strength staff, the training room, and I spent an inordinate amount of time with those people. And so um, I just wanted to know, you know, hey, we care. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to familiarize myself with the football staff itself and I spent time with them and their needs. And, uh, shoot, it's a great fix of football. You ask me to go to 26 schools, I'll go, you know. <laughs> Um, and I love seeing the different ways different people do things. But uh, Oklahoma, actually my first trip to Norman, I had never been to Norman, Oklahoma. I was fired up because I'd known Coach Switzer and I, I, I knew a lot of people that were tied into Oklahoma. Um, it was awesome, you know. Jay Wilkinson had become a friend. Bud Wilkinson's son, mm -hmm. he played at Duke. And so he and I were close, and so all of his stories and Norman, and I went in there and just walked around the campus by myself for a while, too. Uh, and then I know a lot about Austin. I was friends with Coach Royal. Loved the stories that he would tell. I, I'm somewhat of a romantic when it comes to college football. So, yeah, it was a special opportunity to go. Did you go watch these teams practice during the spring? Yes. And did the coach come out of you about evaluating their practices? <laughs> I shouldn't even say this, but absolutely everywhere I go, uh, I, I am, uh, I always prided myself with being good on the grass. What I mean was being a good football coach on the practice field. I've often told players and coaches, the seeds of victory won't grow, grow on a game field. You can sow them all you want. The only place they grow is on the practice floor. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been around some good coaches. Uh, nothing I did was uh, unique. Nothing was attributed to me. But when, when you're fortunate enough to be around Coach Brown, Coach Majors, mm -hmm. 
Philip Palmer. You go visit Bill Walsh. You go visit Belichick. Alex Gibbs was a place. They would have to run me off. Uh, when I was young, single, my off-season was going to pro camps and off-season workouts, and I went to Coach Shula's. You know, I'll never forget just being down in Miami in the off-season watching those pros work. And uh, I would still recommend that to any young coach because what you see is that those guys that get it done on the grass, you can put all the pretty PowerPoints together and the technology is awesome. Don't get me wrong, it is. But if you can't take it out on that grass, you can't coach football. And I scratch my head, to be honest with you, time to time, and I watch certain places. Hmm. Okay, let me just zip my lip, and get in my car and take off, you know? Few people know the Tennessee program better than you. You know what Josh Heifel inherited. What type of job do you think he's done at Tennessee? I think he's done tremendous. My first exposure to Josh was as a player. Uh, we played at Ole Miss, we played him in the bowl game, and he was the quarterback and terrific, and we were fortunate to beat him in a real close ball game and um, had great respect for him there. And then I watched him as he became an assistant coach and uh, was impressed. And then again, I go back to what I said about Mike Leach. People forget that Josh Hyper was tutored by Mike Leach. Wow. Mentors are important, right? You know, I just said that. So um, I went down, my, my son Marcus was working at Central Florida. And Karen and I went down to visit him for Easter and we went a little early, um, I was still coaching at the time, but I checked in, I had Marcus check in, can I come to practice? And it's interesting that he's ended up at Tennessee because my takeaway is watching Central Florida practice on the Josh Hype of spring ball. First thing I knew he was an offensive minded coach, but I was very impressed how aggressive he had his defense be at practice. Uh, you can't be a prima donna offensive coach and expect your defense to be tough if you're always getting on them about getting after you a little too much in practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very evident that the defense developed good habits and they were aggressive mm -hmm. toward that offense. The other thing was I was so fired up because I saw a commitment to the kicking game in spring ball. Mm -hmm. A lot of people won't do certain parts. They may do punt, punt return, they may not even do kick off. They were committed to what I call the big four. Kick off coverage, kick off return, uh, certainly punt and punt return. So it, it kind of made this old Tennessee coach smile because if you know anything about Tennessee football, you know the kicking game is a big issue. So flash forward years later, I've gone up and watched them practice. And I see the same things at, at Tennessee. So we're seeing dynamic offense and tempo offense and things that make it hard for the defense. But I don't see the defense at Tennessee being slighted. I certainly don't see the kicking game being slighted. So uh, he's a coach's son. And the other part of it, I, I, I'm not trying to blow smoke toward him, but he's a coach's son. He's in it for the right reasons. He understands. Coaching is all about the players and what you can do to make them better. We've seen defenses from time to time catch up with offenses, wishbone, whatever. Do you think defenses can catch up with this, or do you think that Heifel's smart enough to stay a step ahead? Well, I think he's proved that he's smart enough to stay a step ahead. One of the things that they utilize is the field. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand, and in my era, I've watched it and I've tried to adjust as an offensive coach. Mm -hmm. The field is shrinking, and what I mean by that, the size and the speed of these defensive football players has increased. We still have the same width and the same depth of field. So these guys cover so much ground that you have to be focused on using both the depth and the width of the field. Now you think for a minute about Tennessee's offense. Have you seen anybody use the width or the depth of a field any better than they do on a consistent basis? No. 
they strike you downfield. They get the ball wide quickly. They make you defend, and then they run it down your throat. Because when you use the width and the depth of the field, you can run the football. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's uh, it's not a gimmick. It's just, it's it's absolutely there to stay. And people will be scratching their heads. The best way, you know, when football really changed offensively is when people got good enough on the defense to go straight man coverage, put an extra guy down in the box, win the one-on-one -on -one battles. But then it comes in, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. We talked about it in Tennessee. I told Philip, I said, we can't win unless we mismatch. We got to recruit receivers like nobody's business because we got to mismatch that man coverage. And when we did that, it was pretty obvious what happened. And I think they've done a great job of continuing to to do that. His receivers, but look at the success they have running the ball because of that. You better yeah, not just go one on one on those guys. So I'm excited to see if our old conference is, you know, is, is interesting. Everybody's got a different approach, and some are similar to Tennessee, but. I'm excited to see what's going to happen over the next few years with all of our programs, but certainly uh, from my past, and certainly my wife, she's she's watching the Big Orange, you know, being a grad. But um, yeah, it's um, it's fun to watch. I want to ask you about two other things: a rule change, and I want to focus on the not stopping the clock after a first down sure. until the last two minutes of a half. Do you think that's going to have a significant impact? Do you think it's only a matter of a few plays? How do you see that? I, I think it's a few plays. It's mm -hmm. not going to be significant. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a move in the right direction. When you're at a game live and you want people in the stands, we need mm -hmm. people in the stands, young people because of their phone and mentality. You're not going to just sit there forever and – and be there three and a half to four hours. We got to do it. We got to do it for the fan base. It's not going to affect the football. We can get the number of snaps we need to get in a game to determine an outcome. And there is some value as it moves forward. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say that it's not going to shorten more from a player safety standpoint. From the number of impacts. Uh, just from the heat index, let's face it, what are we dealing with right now? So what? what is September football going to look like? I'll never forget coaching certain games that I thought I was going to pass out on the sideline when you're on artificial turf. And Florida. So a train, yes, yeah. and the trainer goes <laughs> over there. We played at Baylor when I was at Duke, and the trainer came over and he showed me they held a, a – the thermometer down on the playing surface, 121 degrees. Um, wow, that's yeah. scary, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about, you know, concussion, rightfully so. We've got to manage that in the number of impacts. It's, it's important. But heat can kill you at, mm -hmm. on the spot. Absolutely mm -hmm. take your life away. And so I think all of that things, I've been privy to some of those conversations, even as a coach, when we talk football rules committee. And so we got to just keep looking at it. It's not going to hurt anything. I want to ask you about gambling. This is the last topic. And so I, we heard the commissioner talk about the abuse that people take, whether it's a player, a coach, or an official, after a game from people that had bet on a game and lost. Is it harder to recruit officials into the game because they're catching so much abuse from fans? Yeah, I think the public needs to understand that because of online gimmicks, people are finding out where these people live. They're running down their cell phone numbers. And the gambling part is not even just win and lose. The hard part of these outlier, I don't know if there's a term for them, but the bet on if they're going to make five first downs in the first quarter. They, I mean, they're making up stuff to gamble. Mm -hmm. And then it may be that is, is a quarterback going to throw for 70% in a game, and they think yes, and then this kid takes three or four shots downfield and throws for 67%, and, and he's hearing about it. Uh, 
I mean, young people are, are just shooting bets off their phone so fast, and it's when you have legalized gambling, and you can certainly understand that he mentioned the amount of money it's making for governments and states, and I don't think it's going to go away. And, and the fear I have also is not just the, that abuse. What about the youngster that's sitting in a locker room on the team having fun? It's not about just getting rich at all. Having fun shooting a few bets. Well, guess what? Now you got a disaster of, is it forfeit? Is it, do you have to prosecute? Do you, you, you understand? So we got a real problem there. We listened closely to uh, some people in law enforcement, some people that are doing work that have software to help track and, and limit some of this. Uh, it's a complex problem. I would hope that our great fans of college football help us uh, by we find some way to control this and certainly control your emotions. There's no player nor official nor coach have anything in mind about you losing money based on their performance. That's not that's not happening. People aren't getting bought uh, by folks. You know, that's that's a little far fetched, but certainly people are reacting to when they lose money and God bless them. I, all I can do is pray for you. That's a bad habit. When I was in Destin I interviewed an official with South Carolina, an athletic uh, department official, and I said would you, if you were an athlete, would you allow your student athletes to bet on games not involving the ones they play in? He said, absolutely not. And I said, why not? He said, because let's say they're betting on a football player's betting on basketball, and he loses ten thousand dollars. Now somebody's going to come to him that's a better a gambler and say, hey, you can recoup this money if you'll help throw a game. Do you see an issue with that, allowing student athletes to bet on other sporting events? Yeah, I mean that could be a disaster. It also could be. But that football player comes up to that little point guard and gives him grief and heck about his performance, and now you got a scuffle, uh, and it's oh, it's all about gambling, and you want to talk about scandalous. Mm -hmm. uh, we we all know that everything's constantly changing. The more restriction sometimes creates more abuse, I realize that. But in this case, we, we not only are required, as that AD said, no, we're not gonna allow that, but let's educate them. Let's have genuine conversations. I've talked to our coaches about this. You can bring in experts, but when I'm a, a football coach, and I'm sitting there talking to my team, we have a discussion about how dangerous something is, whether it's alcohol or drugs or gambling or hazing or, that needs to be real and your team needs to be involved. And I think I've learned more from athletes than they've learned from me. And if you, you what my encouragement with our coaches in the SEC is that you'll be shocked at what your players focus is and how well they will state it. And so I hope we just can, can grow conversations in athletics to maybe, and I thought the commissioner was phenomenal yesterday and provided a blueprint for us to find a way to make name, image, and likeness work well. Not, people say, well, I want to get rid of it. Now, that's unrealistic and not right. What's right is to make it work well. And I thought, and I told him last night, I said, that's the best I've heard you format it. And I can tell you spent your whole summer with that. But that is the blueprint we all need to use, in my opinion. David, I appreciate it. Good to catch up with you. Thank you, Jimmy. Right, thank appreciate you. you.